Welcome to Vicious Talk with Benny P. Coming up, an exciting episode. I got my good guest, Connor Larson, back on the podcast. What's up, buddy? I'm just a good guest? What, what's with that, man? My good friend. What's popping? <laughs> I what's thought I was a great guest. <laughs> Keeping Everything's popping, man. We got, a, we got a lot on the docket today, trying to you know flow, get through some of the formalities right off the bat. Connor, obviously, is a well, well-known guest of the podcast. We've been talking a lot of football. Um, predominantly with him on the podcast, but you know we got a lot of stuff to talk about today, including offseason football, because obviously you know that's that's Connor's specialty here on the pod. But um, we're we're here also to promote a little bit of what's been going on with all things analysis. Our website, our feature uh, website, the Vicious Talk is the the podcast for, and on, on all things analysis, we're, we're we got a growing YouTube page, and um, we're running a promotion right now. So Connor. Tell us about the promotion for all things analysis and, and, you know, let's get our listeners excited for it. Yeah. So I think this might tie into one of the themes later in the show when we talk about sports cards and the, uh, the growing market and to kind of capture a part of that trend into some of that excitement, we're going to be giving away some sports cards live on, uh, on YouTube, on all things analysis. We're going to be doing a box break and all you have to do to be entered is to subscribe to our different channels. So, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or right on our website. If you create an account, you'll get an entry. You can get multiple entries. So you can get entered five, six different times. That means you can get five or six different teams. Uh, and we're gonna do the 2020, 2021 Panini Donruss Blaster Box. There's 88 cards in each box. We're doing two of them. Ben, you're gonna break one down all the way in LA or Arizona. I don't know where you're gonna be at the time. I think I'll be in Arizona, uh, but we'll see. And I'll be coming to you guys live from uh, from the Boston area, and uh, we're gonna do a little com- competition. See, so you can pull the better cards. I think I'm gonna get the Lamelo, which means that one of our fans is gonna get a Lamelo, hopefully. Um, but yeah, that's the idea. And and when are the the winners being announced for that? Great question. So we're running the uh, the promotion right now, and we'll probably cut it off on Friday, May seventh, just so we have a day to aggregate you know, everybody's names and make sure we capture everybody who should be part of this giveaway for subscribing. And then on Saturday, May 8th on our YouTube channel, we're going to go live and we're going to break down uh, two boxes of cards and we're going to give away all of them. And uh, just for people who tune in live, we're going to do a little bit of trivia. Ben on, on the show on Vicious Talk has been doing a great job bringing up some fun trivia questions for the guests. So For our live audience that day, we're going to have some other cards, maybe some memorabilia for you guys. So make sure you actually tune in live as well. For sure. Yeah, looking forward. It sounds like it's going to be a really fun promotion. I'm looking forward to being part of it with you. Um, But the the sports card craze has just been really booming. And Connor and I have, you know, growing up, we we both participated in a lot of sports card collecting. And um, we are kind of excited to dabble, get our toes wet back into it. You know, it's, it's, it's a fun hobby something that you know especially during the pandemic a lot of people stuck at home in their quarantines and or you know just have a lot more free time or downtime sports cards is is a a great you know what do you call externality of what came out of this pandemic because i think that the boom of the sports card industry can be attributed to some of that extra free time or hobby time that you know people or people hobbyists were able to get into and you know um, it's crazy some of the stuff that we're seeing with with this industry. It's like it's it's this whole you know, there's a shortage of cards at times. Like people trying to stand in line Friday mornings at like five a.m. to get to Target or Walmart. It's like who's going to Target or Walmart for that kind of stuff? It's crazy. It's and the stuff that's going on with with the whole industry is really interesting. And, and you know, Connor and I wanted to talk about some of that stuff too because, um, like we said, there's just, is a renewed popularity with this whole thing. It's crazy because yeah. when we were growing up we used to go to the card shops and I used to go with my dad and, you know, pick out mm-hmm. like a Ken Griffey junior card for like five bucks. And it was probably right. now it's like, you know, I wish I bought it for, you could sell it for like a hundred. It's sure. like the prices are, are booming for that stuff. Right. Like $10 and you get like a Jersey and, and a, and a bat card. And nowadays yeah. those are going for 10 times that amount on eBay. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it's, and it's not just sports cards. It's Pokemon too. <laughs> like those are selling out everywhere. That's, it's, it's the mem- memorabilia and collectibles game across the board it's that's kind of something i'm not right willing now. to to venture further back into <laughs> pokemon was but when i was a kid i, I was ha- I, I used to actually play pokemon when i was a kid or maybe just like collect the cards and watch the show um but not, not that's not my that's not my cup of tea anymore 
if you have the original 1999 base set, if you have some first editions in there, they're worth a few hundred bucks per card, some thousands. And it's the same thing with your old baseball and, you know, your old basketball collections. Just running through mine, I found a Shaq rookie card that was a limited edition. I had no idea I had it all these years. I was like, whoa, holy crow, you know, the graded, it's worth a couple thousand if you get a gem mint one, but a couple hundred otherwise, which is still pretty exciting. And I think that's also part of the fun about sports cards game. When you're breaking down a box and you're opening up a pack, you get a little bit of a rush. It's a little bit like gambling because you're hoping you pull that lottery ticket that, yeah. you know, that golden totally. ticket out of that candy bar pack. And, you know, maybe you get a, a Christian Yelich signed <laughs> card or a Steph Curry, you yeah. know? Yeah. I was opening up. Connor was, uh, was, was uh, hanging out with me or on a, a Zoom and I was opening up some cards. The uh, Topps Heritage Pack are really popular at Targets and stuff. And so I was able to grab a box and, was opening some of them and i got a i've got a christian yellow signed up card autograph card and that was awesome it's like it's cool to see when you know when you're some of your favorite players or some of the players that you really respect in in a sport that you really admire like baseball and myself it was really cool to see um it's a it's a rush like you said it's a rush to you know pull that card and take a look at what you just found and it's it's cool to have it in your hand to be able to like physically see it something that's like really interesting how we were saw this last week with tops nft release and a lot of mixed reviews with that whole process a lot of people you weren't able to either get the cards that they were promised or there was like a lot of you know a lot of back backlash with the way that they were handling like the payments and the wax payments and stuff like that with nfts and it, it i think it could have gone better for tops but you know it's it's interesting concept that to, you know because the mod modern trends are you know nfts are hot right now there's a lot i think were you trying to put together an NFT for ATA? Yeah, we, we have one. Um, Garrett's the owner, Demet's the creator, which is pretty fun. So we have a one of one ATA NFT <laughs> created on the blockchain backed with Ethereum. So you can trace it back to its original creation. It's pretty cool. And I, I like that idea when it comes to sports cards, because, you know, you could also have an NFT that's tied to a real material object. Yeah. And that can be used as the certifier, the authentication that gets sent to the new purchaser of the material card as well. And so that can be a new way that other than like a, Be a Beckett, you know, certified someone checks it over, you can just have it be tracked through the, through the blockchain the whole time for an actual piece of material too. So I think that that's another way that the blockchain can be used to tie into something with actual physical material value too, not just something that exists on the internet. So you can have the internet version of a card tied to a real card too, which I think yeah. is really I fun think, and cool. I think that's important though, because a lot of people like with cards, they want to see it or they want it like in yeah. their hand, be like, some sort of physical it, version or something. Yeah. So I Put think it that's on really a display important. case. Yeah. It's neat to, to have like a, a, you know, a digital version of the card or a, a, even like some of them are, you know, workable or like a player highlight or something like that. And, it's mm -hmm. interesting. It's it's a cool concept, but like I said, like the, the something about like the collectibles industry is all about the hobbyists want something physical that they can hold or display in their home or something along those lines. Um, but I think there's a lot, you know, more progression to be had in that field. But you know, from what I, from my understanding, when I was reading with some of the tops reviews, it could have gone better than initial release of those NFTs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I like where the innovation is going. I know back in the day when cards were pretty cheaply made it was just printed on a piece of cardboard it was also pretty easy to fake them all the time too because you just needed a decent quality printer it's not like the cut jobs for coming out of tops and coming out of upper deck were decent either so it didn't matter if the card looked like it was perfectly printed you know so people were selling those to you know pawn shops and stuff like that i was watching and the reason i bring this up is i was watching an old episode of pawn stars and somebody tried to sell like a 1950s mickey mantle and yeah the uh Rick comes over. No, nah, that's fake. You know, there's no way <laughs> in this good of a condition. And I think yeah. that's something where NFTs could prevent that, even that type of that's judgment. That's true. Call. It's easier to certify a card that way using those when mm -hmm. you have the backup like that. It's cool. Yeah, I, I specifically, I think so. Tops has a, a 1952 Mickey Mantle card that is like instantly, regardless, basically a regardless of condition. It's like ten thousand dollars or like it's an mm -hmm. expensive card um I, they also did a reprint in like 1992 or like 1993 and yeah. that's i have that version of the card so that one's worth like tops like 20 bucks like it's not yeah it's not the, it's, it's a not, replica insert that's yeah. cool though still 
it's it's a cool card it looks exactly the same as the old one but it just doesn't have like the edges are cut cleanly on the new the mm -hmm. reprint like some of that stuff it's there's just it's just a, a newer version of the card and since it was a reprint it's not it's worth it but it's not worth as much mm -hmm. it's crazy how the, those types of things you know make that the biggest difference it's literally like thousands and thousands of dollars difference because of you know it's the same car but it's just printed a different year but you know it's, right it's not worth nearly the same it's not even you know, a fraction of the price and and small fractions can make a big difference in terms of the grading a card you know is it perfectly centered on the cut is it slight leaning is there any bumps on the corner and that can bring a card from a 10 to a 7 in terms of the grading scale out of 10 and that could cost somebody hundreds possibly thousands of dollars on a scale too which is why I think a big topic right now is whether it's worth it to get your cards graded. Yeah, and I see that question think, a lot on social media. Yeah, and I think the general consensus, and I think this is something you told me, is that unless you have a card that's extremely rare and possibly worth thousands where you can extremely increase the value by having it graded and certified, it's probably better off just to sell it raw and ungraded and just to let people know, hey, this is a close-up picture. This is the best description I can do. This is a raw ungraded card. Yeah, and also if if use common sense because if you if you realistically look at your car and you notice some dings and stuff like that, like the difference between a PSA eight to a PSA ten typically like is almost negligible. Like it's almost it's almost you can't even see it to the naked eye. Right. So, um, if you could see some blemishes to your car, if you see some damages, it's it's almost not worth getting it graded because if you get if you get graded poorly, if you get a poor grading, like it's going to really affect the value ne in a negative way too. So it's not yeah. some, there are some cards where even if you think if you have the mint version of it, it's worth getting it graded. Sometimes it's still, you know, reconsider because you might be hurting yeah. yourself. You wait, you and once you get it graded, money. You, you can't get it ungraded, you know? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. And expense, it's very expensive now to get your cards graded because everyone wants their cards graded mm -hmm. and there's a huge waiting time. You can wait up to a year just to get your own card back. Yeah. And, and like, there, there How much fun is that? Are you kidding me? There are companies that are trying to promise like a quicker turnaround time, but then they run into the same problem. So then they promise a quicker turnaround time and then they get blown up with all these different reviews and then they right, get Right, because they're promising, yeah, the quicker so turnaround it's, time. Yeah, it's it's a, cyc a cyclical process with this stuff and it's really just a lot of a lot of supply I mean, or a lot of demand and not able to supply enough of the gradient process quickly enough. I think when, and you know, somebody trademarked this real quick, Ben, you know, this is ATA property an idea just popped into my head, but how about an app that you can just scan your card from your phone, just like you can scan your check into your bank account, you know, and verify it. So the app scans the card, checks for imperfections, make sure the card's real and gives a grading right on the app. And that's part of the marketplace. That's a pretty cool innovation that I think would be easy enough to do if you think about how Techno technologically advanced iPhones and things of yeah, that nature are that, these days. That's um, that's an interesting idea, and a, a lot of the grading process nowadays has been um, attributed or allocated towards the AI process. Like a lot of computers and stuff like that are helping with the grading process for cards. Um, but there is like that threat of you know a lot of AIs will miss things. Like you'll cut, you'll see a, a card come back with like noticeable blemishes. Or like a off center print or something like that and it'll still be graded like a psa 10. so mm. there are there are like mistakes that happen like that um but you know that's an interesting idea in terms of the the best the best aspect of something like that would be the immediate turnaround or a quicker turnaround mm. something that's like you, people are able to buy and sell cards or at least ballpark graded cards um in, in a more you know quick a quicker fashion being able it'll be more like a stock market instead of you know a collectibles because it's interesting because the the sports card market has been labeled its own the like, unique asset market it's mm -hmm. not like anything else in in the the buyer selling of goods it's 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 really it's its own asset and it's, it's treated that way um the collectibles market in that in that sense is really an interesting market that is not like others and, and we see a lot of like different things and it's it's interesting because i think back to that reddit that the Reddit situation we had a couple months ago with GameStop, where mm -hmm. the Reddit the Reddit users were boosting up that stock, there that can happen in sports cards too, where because it's it's the assets are all um, uniquely controlled by individuals, mm -hmm. there are ways for people to manipulate the market, um, right? And there are people who like buy, try to buy as much of like Jason Tatum cards as possible, and they try to corner the market that way, or like there are Gary V's who mm -hmm. own like 
all t- all kinds of you know he buys like the mark the he corners the market on certain players or certain teams that he really thinks that are going to be incredibly valuable and so that kind of stuff does exist um, right and right and you lower the you lower the supply and then demand increases for the specific cards and you can because you have a monopoly on that card especially if it's like a card out of 50 or out of 99 that's yeah. like a numbered sig card you can probably buy all of them realistically and then okay everybody wants that card because no one has it and you could mm-hmm. sell it for 10 times the value it's, it's not a bad play if you have the money and assets to do it yeah it's it's crazy all the little intricacies that could happen with the market of sports cards because mm-hmm. it's just it's it's totally unique it's totally it's its own thing and it's it's interesting to see how some of that stuff could happen and to be honest I, 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 while i'm very encouraged and very optimistic about sports cards and you know for the at least the, the immediate future next five to ten years i think that we should see a continuation of generally what we've been noticing over the last year or two um in terms of you know the renewed vigor of collecting and in, in the sports collecting market but um it's it, it's really people have to be wary of the bubble of what it could be because it's right. possible that this sports card bubble is something that could eventually pop and the future of the collectibles market could be incredibly volatile. Just, I mean, really, it depends on the individual. It depends on the sport. It depends on the state of the games. Just all different kinds of variables are going to be impacting those types of things. Um, so really, if, if I were to make long-term investments, it's really got to be for known commodities. I'm not going to make a lot of long-term, long-term investments on guys that are younger in their careers and look to you know hold on to multiple like 10, 10 20 years and hope to cash in then because – the volatility of this, what the market could be is incredibly unpredictable. And really their, your best bet for smart investments is trying to get guys who are already like known hall of famers or guys who uh, maybe right. could be voted into the hall of fame soon. Or, I mean, a guy on an it's injury kind of, it's kind or of morbid. going to a slump. It's kind of morbid, but Bill Russell may pass away within the next like five to 10 years. Like that could be a boost to his collectibles market. It's very morbid thought, but you know, that exists in this market as well. So happened with Kobe cards, right? Yeah, exactly. Kobe cards shot through the roof after his passing and you can't buy one now for under a hundred dollars, even just base base sets. Yeah. There's a lot to just flesh into with the whole thing. And I think that uh, while really it's almost like you can't go wrong with any card you're collecting right now in sports markets, everything is going up pretty much for the most part mm-hmm. i don't i don't know that we'll we'll continue to see that for the long term right. i think there there will be some restraint eventually i mean right now it feels like we're surrounded by bubbles honestly okay you know in in you talk about america and you talk about inflation with the amount of money that the fed is pumping into the markets you talk about the stock market and how overinflated values are you talk about cryptocurrency and how how alternate coins like Dogecoin or Dogecoin are going up 500%. You have sports cards going through the roof. At some point, each one of these bubbles is going to pop. They're going to come down in value. The risk to the sports card game is, okay, well, what happens if people just lose interest because there's a reopening and everybody is not on their computers looking up card values all the time and on eBay auctions, they're going to be out on vacations. But also, there's also the risk that what happens if these sports cards companies start flooding the market with more cards? Well, that's what if they just start printing more cards? That's what happened in the eighties and nineties yeah. that cost that's there was the junk card era, you know, well, the that's wax one card thing era. That, um, a lot of like tops and Don Russ are, are incredibly aware of nowadays. So that's mm. one thing that people collectors can at least lean back on a more positive fashion or, or be more positive about optimistic about um, because the, Don, Tops and Don Russ have discussed, like, you know, they, they've publicly, you know, made comments about the the hesitancy to flood the market with certain cards or, or trying to right. make sure, ensure the rarity of some specific cards or, or lines of their, their card mm-hmm. brands and stuff like that. And so that is something that card, like, because it's more organized, every card has a number, every card has a specific allocation for so the, what the quantity is going to be be in the in the final version is of them. Um, mm. There is a lot more calculation with where cards go and how many cards are distributed and stuff like that. So there is a lot more calculation with how that's monitored and right. every card is categorized and and um, and journaled or, or they have complete records of what's been released. 
And mm-hmm. that's something that is because it's a modern era is a little bit less uh, risky in mm-hmm. in what you said how in the eighties and like they were doing just mass reprints and they weren't they were not holding value because they had just flooded the card market. And so that's right. definitely uh, an aspect of you know the new the, with tops and Don Russ and all these other cards. Royal Royal Crowns I think is another one. There's there's different you know, companies that are trying to be aware of, you know, avoiding mm-hmm. that issue. Yeah, Fleer and, and Chrome and all those upper deck. But it, what's interesting too is these companies, you, you're absolutely right. It's it's a financial decision for them to release a certain amount of cards because if they lose their secondary market value, then they also lose their retail value. If oh. someone can't sell a box of cards they buy in Target for twice as much on eBay, they're much likely to want to go wait in line at Target to buy that box of cards initially. Um, what's interesting too is we're going to get a lot more insight into what they, these card companies are thinking because Tops is becoming a public company on the stock market. So they're going to have to start releasing quarterly earnings. They're going to have to do earnings calls where they're talking about their strategy, uh, right. what types of things they're releasing, product updates. So it's actually going to be pretty cool. We can start to get um, a little bit more information besides just what they post on their website and a, a little bit of a deeper look into you know, some of these card companies. Totally. I, I think that as a collector, you got to have um, long-term, both long-term and short-term strategies for this. Cause obviously, I mean, it's, it's a fun hobby, but for a lot of people, it's an investment because I mean, the pricing of a lot of these cards is, is skyrocketing. So you're going to be, mm-hmm. if you're collecting cards, you, you're investing a little bit and you're, you're investing with hopes of eventually getting your money back or, at right. least, or make it a profit, hopefully. And um, what I think you got to do is, while it's really fun to to you know snag that Lamella Ball Prism card or Anthony Edwards or John ja Morant pr- Prism card or something really valuable like that for a young player, I think that when you when you experience a boom for a, pl- a young player like that, so you get a Luka Doncic rookie card and you know he wins the NBA Finals in in a year or two, like that could be the time to you know capitalize on mm-hmm. the boom. Like if you get a boom for a player that you own, if the if the the value of your card skyrockets, like to 500 percent like you should be looking to cash in for the most part because you don't know when that next boom is going to come or if it's going to come at all like i was mentioning right. how the the you know the long-term volatility of this market could pop at any moment um but really the long-term investments are the ones that we're talking about with like bill russell's you know michael jordan's always a good investment he's his, his card you know that that card i he, he, he broke he broke the record right it was like 1.7 mil or something like that 1.8 mil his card yeah his card sold one went for two point i think a brady went for like 2.9 or something yeah like, like th- those cards are i mean obviously when you when if you, you know it's an all-time great player right there, you know lebron cards, though, brady like that, like that michael jordan. jordan card is not one that you're going to want to invest in because it's not going to go up from there you know what i mean mm-hmm. like that's like that's the highest it's going to get so there are cards like there are there are excellent players that you know their their values will continue to go up, but you also have to know when the value has peaked, and that's mm-hmm. the peak value for a Michael Jordan rookie card or whatever card it was. Like that's not going to be something that you're going to continue to grow on. So like it's a push and pull. It's it's you know. So each- let's play a little little bit of a game, Ben, because I have four players in mind, and I want to do a little bit of buy or sell on their cards with you. So you, you down for this? Okay. All right, They're going to be football players. So uh, you're thinking about the 2020 rookies uh, in, in the NFL. And you talk about maybe their prism cards, all right? So the, the big four quarterbacks people are looking to get are Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Tua, and Jalen Hurts. These are cards that are going for base base cards going for double digit dollars. If you get a, a patch, a rookie, or, or a number, they're going for hundreds or thousands. All right, so let's stop. Start from the top. Let's go with Justin Herbert, rookie of the year. You buying? You holding? You selling? Totally. Yeah, I would buy Justin Herbert stock because really, cards. What's really neat about playing cards, or I mean, sports cards, um, not playing cards, sports cards, is when you look at the back and you look at the stats. Like Justin Herbert, at the end of his career, is gonna have a full fucking sports card. Like his stats, right. his stats are gonna be Drew Brees. Like he's gonna he's gonna have a full list. And so while you're getting a rookie card, you're not gonna have that. You eventually it, when, by the point is the stats for Justin Herbert point. are going to be incredible by the end of his career. And so he's a guy that you have you have to have some long term optimism for. Mm-hmm. But like I was saying for young players like that, 
if Justin Herbert wins an MVP award along his career, if he wins a Super Bowl, if you see sell like, right after, I would sell. I would look to sell most likely. Okay. Um, but you know, that's, that's almost for any player really. And I don't have the long, yeah. I don't have the kind of long-term, uh, guarantee of, you know, a substantial income to, you know, bank on like, mm-hmm. you know, I have, oh, knowing I have like, a you know, multiple thousand dollar card in my, in my, you know, my back safe, like, I'm not going to maybe like sit on it for years. You know what I mean? Like I, I could use right. that money. So that's, mm-hmm. that's, you know, it's different for everybody. Everybody has their own, you know, specific. Yeah. And I think you make a great point about the statistics for someone like Justin Herbert, because on the back of that rookie card, you're going to see that he broke the rookie record for touchdowns. Yeah. So that's something that's going to hold value. If you have the rookie card of a player on the back of it, that also holds a record. That's going to be awesome. So let's move on to the next guy, Joey B, Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is possibly the most unpredictable member of that group that you, you, you just listed off because Joe Burrow is obviously very young very talented. He looked great before he tore his ACL. And so we got, we got to see how he looks after that, but you could also look at it as an opportunity to buy low on a guy like this, where mm-hmm. Joe Burrow was possibly people were most, the most optimistic and the most, uh, you know, concern, or they were most looking fans were most looking forward to his performance as a rookie. Right. Um, and he didn't disappoint really. He, he was excellent for the time he was mm-hmm. out there. Just uh, the ACL is, is always something you gotta be wary of. People have, it has really hindered or, you know, shot down some people's careers, some great players careers. And while I don't think I'm praying, that's not the case with Joe Burrow. He's a hard, incredibly hard worker. You, you'd like to think that he is going to recover from this. You could maybe look at it as it's a risky buy low opportunity because it's uh it's Joe Burrow could come back next year. And especially, you know, I would love to see him paired up with, you know, Jamar chase from LSU pair up with his old, his old teammate from uh, Louisiana state. I, I want him to get protection. I want them to draft Sewell, Sewell. and put him on the O line and yeah. and just make sure that he doesn't well, get the, nailed the, again the in the legs while trying to throw to Higgins. Him. That's a good right. pick. That's going to help him. You know that six, I th- that six I would, pick is going to be a player that's going to. I Joe would Burrow. buy a Joe Burrow card right after the draft if they draft Sewell. If I see them draft Sewell, I'm I'm buying in. He's going to have more protection. He's going to have the stats this year. If they don't address the offensive line, he's just going to get murdered all over again, and the chance yeah. for another injury, possibly a career ender. You know, when you already lost one ACL, if he has another bad injury to that leg or possibly the other one compensating, there goes the value of the card. His career is over. So definitely a risky buy low. But if they address that offensive line, it's a guy I'm buying into personally. Yeah. When injuries take place, especially significant injuries like that, you have to look at the the player's individual situation and determine for yourself whether or not you're going to be optimistic for that player's future or whether or not this injury could really hinder their potential, you know, output going forward i think we both feel comfortable with herbert and burrow because they're clearly the locked in starter on their teams i think what's interesting there's been a little bit of controversy and discussion around the next two guys on the list i mentioned being tua and jalen hurts so tua they've been saying oh should we keep him as our quarterback they went back and forth last year with fitzpatrick and yet his rookie cards going from close to as much as joe burrows what do you think about uh tua there ben you know i'm not a tua guy um i Look, I, I think Tua is a, a league average at best quarterback. While he has, mo- he can have moments where the the legs and the the strong arm can get him to you know a uh, uh, occasional impressive performance. I don't think Tua is going to be the kind of player that uh, leads a franchise to Super Bowls or long playoff runs. I think he's you know limited in what his abilities can produce on the field in the NFL and. Well, I did love his performances in Al- at Alabama. I just don't think the NFL is going to be uh, – I, I just don't see him being the, the kind of star player that Herbert and Burrow could be. He just – something about the way that he's looked in Miami, and I, I, I just don't know that he has that, that skill set that I'm looking for out of right. – uh, I think you could, you could sell high on Tua possibly on, in some aspects. Or it went to a you know, experiences a boom – when Miami Miami is gonna have, be a good team this year, there could be a, boom, a Tua boom, and because right. if, if Tua could play well this year, and so that could be you know an opportunity to maybe you know sell high on a Tua rookie card or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think if you, I think I don't mind selling Tua right now just because there's risk next year that if he starts playing badly, they could clearly could make, some, they could bench him. They could have, they could clearly signal they could start trading some players away, loading up on draft picks for the following year signaling that they're ready to move on at quarterback and and there you go your card loses a ton of value you know 
he was outplayed by Ryan Fitzpatrick on his own team, given it was his rookie year and injured. So still potential, but I, I'm a little bit worried about Tua. I don't mind the idea of selling now or maybe holding and hoping he gets off to a hot start and then selling midseason, but probably not someone I feel the most confident about long-term, especially with that hip injury. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I, I'm probably a sell or a hold and sell on Tua. He's, and then he's the last guy. Oh, yep. Go, go ahead. ahead. Yep. Go. You okay. Want, you so want the last guy I'm ready to transition into Hertz. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and maybe this is also a good segue into our next topic, which is, which is the draft, because we have the Eagles not signaling whether they're ready to name Jalen Hurts as their quarterback. Bizarre. We had all the controversy Bizarre. last year, and yet the owner clearly wants to build around this team. It seems like the coach was brought in as like a second Frank Wright to help get Carson Wentz online, but Wentz just wanted out of there. So now we have another quarterback controversy possibly, and Hurts looked like a decent enough player to where I feel like he could get a shot. And he should get his shot as the starting quarterback. Why aren't they putting the confidence in him? And why is his card still being sold for so much? Uh, my my guess, I, I mean, I haven't done too much reading about with the situation, but my guess when I saw that headline that they weren't naming him the, the starter was just some sort of typical new NFL coach trying to, you know, be rah-rah and, and traditional, like, you know, we will work hard in this organization. We're going to earn everything, like – he uh, he's got to go into Philadelphia, you know, considering Jalen Hurts is starting quarterback. You can't, you can't be, like, you you wouldn't take the job if that wasn't the case, really. Um, but you know, that's just kind of, you know, a, a culture that the NFL has bred. You know, you got to earn it. You got to nothing's given to. You. I'm a new coach. You got to earn your spot on my roster. Every if, every one of the 53 players has to earn their spot on our team. Like that's going to be, it sounds like the mentality they're going to have in Philadelphia this year. So I, I don't take too much stock out of that. I think Jalen Hurts is the kind of player that wouldn't get mentally shaken up by something like that. Very, you know, known for his strong leadership ability and, and strong right. mental capacity. I mean, the guy's a leader and you, we saw that both in Alabama and at Oklahoma yeah. in his college years. And so very I composed be, player. Yeah. I wouldn't be too worried about that. And, you know, Hertz is someone I'm extremely optimistic about because hmm. if you're looking at his cards, it could be an opportunity to buy low before he booms again, because he, mm -hmm. while he finished the season strong, leading to a lot of people like myself to fantasy championships, um, he could be someone that takes another step forward again next year. <laughs> Bringing up your fantasy championship yeah. casually months later. Right. Screw you. <laughs> I love it. No, but Jalen Hurts is somebody that could be a fantasy monster. Rock star. Could be a rock and, star and with that, his legs. That has an aspect in the collectibles market. Like that's that's a factor. Because if he's, you know, the, the a top five fantasy quarterback, every fantasy owner is gonna be willing to you know, want to collect his card. And there's going to be a lot of overlap in those yeah. two markets for sure. So that's, that's something to consider as well. And while, you know, maybe the long-term value of a guy like Jalen Hurts isn't incredibly reliable. Like you don't know how his future in the NFL is going to shake out because the type of player that he is, and, you know, he's a very physical guy, he uses his legs a lot. Like an injury could really derail that type of skill set that he has, that he flourishes on. Um, but the immediate, like, two, three year window with Hertz could be, you know, incredibly optimistic, incredibly valuable. So I would definitely maybe look to buy and hold Jalen Hertz right now. And then with hopes of a, a bubble coming within the next couple of years or so, or, or a boom coming in the next couple of years. Yeah. Someone with the type of talent that if he puts together the passing, he could have a very strong season on the ground and through the air. The question is, can he put up the, the yards per game, that we're looking for that's going to maintain somebody in a starting quarterback position. We know he can do it with his legs. Totally. Yeah, the, the what the Eagles do in the draft is going to be interesting for them. I mean, it, I don't think they have a first-round pick. Um, but the this this draft is incredibly interesting. And, and what's crazy is, you know, I, it, I've been seeing – draft pit like draft analysis and stuff like that for almost a month or two now and it's like mm -hmm. the draft isn't even until i think it's like may 9th or something like that or may 8th like it, it's 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 still a ways away we got weeks to go and so there's gonna be a lot of you know different storylines that come and go within the next couple of weeks before the actual draft takes place but everybody's jumping these players are like, moving like yeah. crazy it, we keep mac jones is like the top of the second round and right. all of a sudden he's a top 10 pick now and i'm like what changed 
Yeah. What, what what happened in the meantime? Where I mean, all of a sudden just, he's a top Justin prospect. Fields. Justin Fields keeps sliding according to these mock drafts, and then, and then and then you'll see him go at second to the New York Jets. It's like right. where's nobody has any idea besides after Lawrence after the first pick. Like nobody right. has any idea of who wh- who's going where. Is that is what I'm gathering? Because mm-hmm. it, it, I, how many how many different storylines have you seen already on the NFL draft? It, it's it's endless. I think Lawrence is the only locked in player that I would feel comfortable predicting at this point. I mean, the rest of the rest of the first round is kind of all over the place. Did, did you see the news that um, the, the guy out of Alabama, the wide receiver, is that Devonta Smith? Um, yeah, Devonta Smith and, and Jalen Waddle. So Smith weighed in at 166 pounds. <laughs> He's tiny. Six foot two, 166. He's tiny. Are you dude. kidding me? The thing I weighed Devontae 166 Smith... in seventh grade. <laughs> That's incredible. About... They talk about what Smith is his incredible. Obviously, he he won the Heisman, but so he's incredibly fast and incredibly gifted with his hands. But he uh his his best attribute on the field is his mind. He's an incredibly mm-hmm. smart receiver. He'll come back. They were saying he would come back uh, after you know drives and and sit down with the with the offense and talk about what they were doing and what they were doing in coverage and and what to look for going forward. And like the guy is is uh, all all pro type of talent in terms of what he sees and yeah. is able to comprehend on the football field and while that is his bait his big knock this 166 light he's a very lightweight receiver um i think that that's the most fixable attribute of a player right like, of his skill set i mean he's all he already has the skills to to succeed at some of the highest levels we saw how well great hands did. great speed yeah. absolutely so the Giants are have been the team that has been highly rumored to be targeting him at, at eleven. So that could be one of your guys that you know joins you in New York. Imagine Kenny G and Devonta on both sides of the ball. That would be incredible. Ingram and Barkley. That offense. I, I mean, I, if they drafted him, let me get some Dan Jones rookie cards, okay? Because <laughs> he might break out. He's a guy who has the potential and the talent, and just really hasn't ever had a team that seemed organized and had all its weapons healthy healthy on the field right he didn't really get to play with odell they went ahead and traded for golden tate who oh awesome a field stretcher not really you know they let him go this year finally they're bringing in some talent so we get to actually evaluate if he doesn't do it this year though he his career is done move on yeah i i'm super interested to see what the patriots do with the draft this year because they got the 15th pick and there's a lot of talk about their desire to move up and select one of these you know quarterbacks that they're targeting I'm hearing uh, Mac Jones is the latest, right? Well, the connection with Nick I've, Saban. Yeah, Mac Jones is a guy that kind of makes sense with, you know, the, what they try to do in the in the Patriots offense. But I mean, also Justin Fields has been a guy that I know Bill Simmons has been incredibly, uh, you know, big on the Justin Fields bandwagon, hoping that they could trade up, snag him. But you know, if they stay at 15, a lot of people in the mock drafts have been projecting them to get Waddle out of Alabama, which would be an incredible snag for them. I mean, Jalen Waddle, Nelson Aguilar, like those two tight ends, Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry, that's an elite yeah. passing game. Like that, that's, those are some good passing weapons. And so they're great tight ends. Fantastic. That's really going to help Cam Newton. Cause that's exactly what he does. But what's interesting is if you Cam bring Newton, in, so worrisome. yeah, if you bring in Justin Fields, what I like about that is if Cam struggles mid season, you don't really have to change the offense too much because True. Justin Fields is a very large um and athletic mobile quarterback a very big build like cam too who can handle a lot of the same duties the that cam does around the goal line for sure a comp so if you say okay now we have a struggling cam let's put him on the back burner just have a mentor justin for a few games and let, let's get justin in this offense the weapons will work just as good for justin Fields as they do for cam newton so that is an interesting thought if they go go that direction but i think that's someone they would have to probably trade up for and well Belichick doesn't trade up for anyone. Yeah, exactly. That's not that would, that would go against his style. I think he's only done that like maybe two or three times in his, t- right. his entire tenure. So that would not be something that he's you know done a lot of. the The Patriots signings for free agency during the NFL, NFL offseason were were pretty interesting to me because that they were the they were the the headline in day one of free agencies, which is not not something I'm familiar with. Not with typical fan. for sure. Not typical. That's why Tom Brady left because it's completely atypical for them. Yeah, it was interesting because I mean, you look at just in general when you're bidding on players in, in free agency, like day one is when you're not, you're getting the worst deals. Like you're paying up your top dollar for your guys, your targets. Like that's when guys are going to get paid the most money on day one when, you know, they're, they're taking their number one options. Mm-hmm. And usually the Patriots try to, you know, 
get guys in and save the most value as possible as they could get, like get the most value out of their signings, you know, get bargain players and, you know, get the, the clear, the guys on clearance. And they, they went out and spent a lot of money on guys like Nelson Aguilar, Johnny Smith, Johnny Smith. I really do like Hunter mm-hmm. Henry. Um, you know, there was a lot of guys that the linebacker, I can't, remember, can't, I can't believe I'm forgetting all their names, but they, 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 ha- they have what they spent like over a hundred million dollars on day one. Like that's not something that the Patriots have done very often. And you have to wonder how much of it is related to maybe trying to keep Belichick around because I don't think he wants to sit with a mediocre team for another couple of years either. Yeah. He's getting up there in age and he might pull a Brady and move out of town. Yeah. The, the, my thought was, you know, the Patriots probably looked at it as they are a, t- a team that tries to, you know, spend $80 on the dollar or, you know, 75 mm-hmm. cents to the dollar they try to mm-hmm. find like you know the the big the best like I said values for players and it points on the margin. Absolutely. This year, this year the off season has been strange because there are a lot of teams that have no cap space. They have no cap flexibility whatsoever. They cannot spend money, or if they do, they're yeah. going they're going completely in the red. Like there are a lot of teams that are in this situation, and so the Patriots. You wonder how many other teams they were bidding against. Maybe they knew what the market was going was going to look like. Because because let's be honest, like the free agency period be- begins on that day. I think it was like what uh, I can't it was uh, February something, February twenty something, or I can't remember the day it was, but the or maybe March. I can't remember whatever. But the point is, you the you can't uh, be expecting that teams are honoring that free agent code where they're not allowed to talk to players before you know, the negotiating period starts, like they're going, even if they're not directly talking talking to, yeah, yeah, they're talking to people in their camp. Like there's a lot of work around with that stuff. And teams know my people have talked to your people, right? They know that I don't have to talk to Ben, but I can have Demi talk to your, your girlfriend or your sister or something. Right. We can communicate that way. So there is, you you can't deny like that's happening. Like the Patriots had an idea of what these guys were going to sign for and they figured it was worth it for them. And so really for me, the only one that I, I was questionable about, was the Nelson you don't think the one? Patriots are willing to cheat? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, watch yourself. No, uh, Nelson Nelson Aguilar was the one for me that I was like, ah, uh, that might be too much. But you know, it's only a two year deal, so uh, he did play well last year in you know in uh, Oak or not oh, Las Vegas. I was gonna say Oakland. Yeah, exactly. On the Raiders, he had over 900 yards. It seemed like he was always streaking open, catching a deep ball mm-hmm. from Derek Carr, who's not a great deep I'm ball just, thrower, too. I'm haunt, so very I'm impressive by, season. I'm haunted by Aguilar's performance in Philadelphia still, though. Like, I know – because I followed Aguilar, you know, his career because he was a USC Trojan and mm-hmm. um, someone that I liked in college, and he just – he was not good with Philadelphia. He dropped it. Drop that. Remember that. Remember that clip of Dropped the guy. A ton of passes. Remember the clip oh. of that guy who saved someone from a burning building or something like that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, he I, caught I a caught baby. I caught the baby, but not like Nelson Aguilar. He gives the camera like. Yeah, that. he's like, thank, <laughs> thank God, Aguilar wasn't the one under the baby. Would have gone through his hands. <laughs> like, oh, dang, that's yeah, crazy. That was hilarious. Um, but the, really, the pages were the storyline with day one, and so we'll have to see how that. They have a lot of guys coming back. They have a, they're going to have a very different roster next year. I'm optimistic as a Patriots fan. And what, I think the draft is going to indicate what they're going to try to do this year, though, because if they get their targets in the draft, I think that's going to be really encouraging for them going into the season. Yeah, and I think one thing that has to play into the fact why Belichick never traded up is because they had Tom Brady all those years. So mm-hmm. typically when you do trade up for a player, it's for a quarterback. Otherwise – there usually is a, a, a decent talent pool that you can select from later in the round, but quarterbacks you have to pay a premium for. So it'll be interesting now that the Patriots actually do need a quarterback. Are they willing to move up and pay that premium? Like they did in the off season on day one, they paid that premium to get those tight ends and the wide receivers. Are they going to do it for the quarterback in the draft? I think it's possible. It's going to be interesting this year. I don't out of all the years previously where you, you know, I would have guessed most of the time the Pats would have traded out of the pick and moved back in the draft. That's what they do. They get value, right? This year they might move up. They need to get a quarterback to fix this, uh, you know, this, this hole they have on their team. Yeah. And what's crazy is, you know, we got a loaded quarterback class five, like guaranteed first rounders. You got Lawrence Wilson uh, fields, Trey Lance, and, Lance and, yeah. and uh, Mac, Jones. Mac Jones. And so, Really, if the Patriots are able to land Jones, Fields, or or Lance, I think that they would consider it a positive draft for them. But the the hit rate on quarterbacks in the draft is literally like like 
two to one. Like you, you, you mm-hmm. hit fifty percent of your of your quarterback drafts essentially, and the odds of the, of one of those there, there's going to be two or three of those players that don't pan out. I guarantee right. it. Like there's going to be. Two are you going to get a Mahomes and a Watson, or are you going to get a Rosen and a Trubisky? Right. right? So it's a lot of risk with, with trading up. And so I see why the Patriots in the long run have avoided that trend, but this might be the, the you know, the, uh, the situation that, you know, calls, calls for the exception. And, and we'll see what, what Belichick wants to do. I, I don't know what – it's hard to predict what they're going to, you know, interpret how their situation goes. But other teams to, to watch out for their, their offseason, I really love what the Browns have been doing, the Cleveland Browns. And so they're looking to be going into this season, build off the, you know, last year they had an – Encouraging year with Kevin Stefanski's first first uh, head coaching season for them. They signed Jadavian Clowney, Malik Jackson, Troy Hill, and John Johnson. Really, you know, shirt up that defense in in Cleveland. Bringing back Odell Beckham Jr. This uh, him coming back from the ACL injury. Hopefully, getting a full Nick Chubb and and uh, Kareem Hunt healthy season. Baker Mayfield hopefully coming back and improving on last year. Like they're a team that a lot of people are going to be optimistic about, and one of those hype teams. Are you, are you going to be optimistic about them this year? Absolutely. I mean, the back half of the year they looked fantastic. They have a really exciting defense with Miles Garrett, Nick Chubb, and Kareem Hunt are one of the best duos out of the backfield. Probably the best running back combination in the league. And if you saw their passing game, the way it opened up with Odell gone and Baker kind of free flowing across the field. If they can get back to that with Odell on the field and not over target him, and hopefully he is going to come back in slowly and not require all the targets after seeing the success the team had without him. I mean, he's an amazing player, an amazing talent, and somebody I'd still rather have on the field than not. And I think it still increases their potential when you have a guy who previously has gone for 1,500, 1,400 yards in a season. So Totally. Okay, what about Miami? The Miami Dolphins signing Will Fuller, Malcolm Brown, Jacoby Brissett, really trying to you know ensure that their offense is going to be consistent again this year. Uh, I I was intrigued by the Brissett, the Br- Jacoby Brissett backup signing because I think he's one of the better backups in the league. And so if like you said, yeah. if Tua struggles at all this year, Brissett might be a guy that could at least pull the the hat the rabbit out of the hat and help them make the playoffs if if they're in a similar situation last year where they won. 11 games right and they missed the playoffs like that might that 12th game might have been the difference so So, yeah he's certainly a serviceable quarterback I really like Miami again you know Xavier Howard incredible um interesting that they let let go of Kyle Van Noy after one of his best seasons obviously went right back to the Pats Mm -hmm. so uh it's going to be interesting to see what they do they fully committed to Tua and they're bringing in Will Fuller so they're going to give him the weapons he needs you think maybe Preston Williams is going to come back Devontae Parker, one of the best 50-50 catch balls in the, in the, in the league. Uh, and then you add in Will Fuller, who's a complete speedster. Maybe that will open up the outside of the field where Tua had a lot of trouble throwing. He was very accurate across the middle, but he didn't really like to go long and outside. I really hope – I love Kyle Pitts in this draft. I think he's the best player oh, in this draft. Incredible. I hope he goes to Miami. It would be really, Dude, it would be really the fun. The Gesicki and Pitts combo would remind me a lot of the Gronk and Hernandez combo. Yeah. Gesicki, the larger player, really good at boxing out 50-50 balls. And then the Hernandez style. And, and, of course, he's coming out of Florida, too, which is really funny comparison. But Kyle Pitts, the athleticism out of this guy and the way he can run routes is just incredible. He, he's a one-of-one one in this draft and, and a, probably a, a top-five talent. So yeah, really interesting how they operated that trade, that trade, the double trade that they made where they traded back and then traded up or they Warren Sharp was expressing this on the Bill Simmons podcast. Like they wouldn't have made that first trade if they didn't know they had the second one already. So like they, yeah. they didn't see it as trading back and then back up. They were just trading back three slots to, you know, get yeah, it's essentially trade. just like a they, three they, team they, trade, right? They, they, I, I, the way I see it is they probably figure that they're guaranteed to get either Pitts or Jamar Chase. And I think those are the two guys that they're going to try to bring in. Both of them are elite pass catching options that are going to help Tua. Um, so, mm-hmm. I mean, like how we, how we were talking about Tua's card, uh, card, you know, card value, yeah. Card value going forward. Those could be the kind of players that really help Tua succeed in his career. So that would be really good for them, I think. And he has really good pass catching running backs in uh, Salvin Ahmed and Miles Gaskin. Both guys – when you have a pass catching running back like that, that really helps inflate the quarterback stats because they can take a dump off pass for firm five yards and, and make it go 40 yards. You know, we saw it multiple times last season. So another way that 
Tua can have that support system around him. He just has the dump off pass that, that he needs. But if you think about the weapons that could be surrounding him after the draft with the signings, I mean, they're really setting it up for his success, just like the Giants are doing with Danny Jones. They're kind of saying like, okay, we're going to give you the keys to the car. If you crash it, you're not getting the keys back. Yeah. I also really like what the Kansas City Chiefs did this offseason. They, you know, the glaring weakness in their Super Bowl performance last year was the offensive line. And what did they do? Yep. They go out and stop. overhauled it. Kyle Long, Joe Thune, Austin Blythe, like they they directly address address the the glaring weaknesses that they had in the offensive line. And the the Chiefs, you know, the rich get richer. I mean, they're gonna have hopefully some better protection for Mahomes with and with, with Mahomes being better protected, who knows what that man could do. I mean, it's crazy what he already does. You know, we, what do you run like 400 something yards, something like that, 500 yards last uh, in the Super Bowl? They tracked like how far he ran. The guy yeah, was scrambling on a, on a, all constant treadmill, like crazy, always running. And he was, he, he nearly had like some of the best throws that we'd ever seen in the Super Bowl. If it's just, you know, a tip pass here or, or just like a few inches here, like there, he almost had an incredible game. And what, if, if you give that guy a little bit more time, you give him a little bit more space to work with, it'll be impressive to see what he could do. Uh, Cause he's already, you know, the best quarterback that any of us have ever he, seen. He's the game. most valuable asset in the NFL right now. And when you have a valuable asset, you put security around it, you protect it. And they did not do that last year in the Super Bowl. They're doing what they need to do to protect their asset. And literally he is, he's signed to a huge mega contract. He's costing them hundreds of millions of dollars. They cannot afford to let this guy get injured. So, 100%. and this is a you know, multi-year decision, a decade, you know, they have this guy for, for the foreseeable future. So absolutely doing the right things. Last last and, NFL question. Last NFL question. Are you how are you feel about Deshaun Watson in this incredibly bizarre situation? He wanted to get traded. They weren't trading him. And then this whole story about multiple, multiple, like over a dozen women talking about being victimized sexually in during massages that that Watson had been, you know, taking throughout the Houston area. Really a bizarre story. What what are, what are your thoughts on, on Watson this offseason? I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy how initially when he was going through the process of trying to push his way out of Houston, he literally was seen as one of the most likable players in the league, a guy who does everything right, and how quickly that can flip on its head. And I think it's important to remember that we really don't know what's going on behind the curtain. And I think it's important to take these accusations seriously and to you know make sure that we don't blindly – push them away just because he's a famous athlete. I mean, obviously there seems to be some type of trend here. I don't, I don't Again, who, I don't care who you are. Like you could be a famous athlete or not. Like nobody wants your penis to touch them. Like, <laughs> with, with, like involuntarily, like, right. Don't take your penis out in front of somebody who doesn't want to see it like that. That's not cool. Like that's right. The stories are just terrible. Awful. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's sickening to see like a player just take advantage of, or a, a, mm -hmm. any sort of celebrity, like take advantage of that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like, Dude, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, in, innocent until proven guilty. So I'm not going to, I'm going to condemn the actions he's accused of 100%. Do not do that. Do we know if he actually did those actions? No. So I'm going to let it play out in a court of law and make sure that evidence is brought to the table. And I think he should get yeah. punished to the fullest extent if these stories are true. If not, then he's, he's a good quarterback, a really good talent. And I hope he can bounce back from it if these are false accusations. But it's just, it's a really sickening story and very disheartening. Yeah, for me, I mean, obviously, like, that's just, like, despicable, that, that kind of, the actions that he's being accused of. And if they are true, and there has to be some sort of truth to what they're saying, like, maybe not all of it. I mean, hopefully, they, you know, he's not as terrible of a person that they're... You know, I mean, we have to be. hope it's not true, right? Yeah. I, I would prefer it not to be true, but if it is, I, he, you have to he, make sure that you support the victims of, of this crime and, and make sure yeah. that he's punished. For, for me also, like, there's kind of, like, a really despicable and slimy aspect of this is, like, maybe is it a time that you could buy low on a guy like Deshaun Watson? Like, it, it if this turns out, even, like, worst-case scenario he gets convicted of or he gets charged with guilty with you know multiple counts of misdemeanor sexual assault, sexual assault or like, something he he's he's still gonna like you know eventually play nfl football at, again at some point like he he should make it back on the football field at some point and he's only what 26 27 years old like he gets maybe suspended a, a one year at worst like he gets suspended one season at, that's maybe the worst case scenario so like it's a pretty slimy 
you know, concept or idea, but is it a time that you could maybe buy low on a franchise quarterback? Because you could either in the real football, you, you could trade for a guy like that, knowing right. that, you know, maybe he has a suspension coming his way, but you pay like 25 cents to the dollar for a guy like, you know, that could really change the franchise around when he's playing healthy on the football field. And even like in, in the collectibles market, like maybe this is, I think this is going to severely impact his likability, obviously. So oh, yeah, for it's sure. Gonna, you know, impact his collectibles market. But if he wins a Super Bowl, if he wins an MVP, like there will be a boom at some point for that for mm -hmm. that market of his. And so it could be a chance to buy low on some of the stuff with Deshaun Watson. And it's a, it's a slimy aspect, but, you know, you're trying to we're talking about trying to find value on the margins here. And and, uh, you know, Watson, you know, it's an incredibly complicated situation, but it could be an opportunity to, to you know, to capitalize on some of the value you could get on a guy like this. Yeah, I mean, in, in real NFL terms, he, he would help a lot of different teams. The question is, is there the value there? Are you able to get him low enough because of the possibility of the suspension or not? And we really don't know what's going to happen. You know, he might be banned from the league if these accusations come out to be true. I mean, there's a lot of accusations, so there could be a big... I don't, I don't think Houston would trade him amidst the controversy because of... Of the fear because of the value proposition for yeah, sure he, nobody really knows what he should be valued at this point because of what's been going on so i i just i wanted to throw that out there because i think it, it would be interesting consideration all right mm -hmm. can we talk some nba basketball absolutely absolutely all right, let's, let's, let's do, do let's do five to ten minutes on nba basketball here because we're getting into the the final i think we're going into the final maybe dozen or so games of the season the easter conference contenders are you know brooklyn philadelphia boston starting to make a run Atlanta's going to be the four seed. There's going to be some good teams in the East. But for me, it comes down to Philadelphia and Brooklyn, whether or not they're going to be healthy. Um, I think if Brooklyn stays healthy, they're going to be the team to beat, obviously. Um, the talent with Brooklyn is just historic. I mean, the, you, you pair up three of those guys, Harden, Kyrie, and Durant. Like, it's, it's impressive to watch when the three are on the court, but it's only happened like seven times this year. So – that's going to be their major X factor with, with Brooklyn. And so if Brooklyn falters at all, I think Philadelphia is going to be happy, happy to pick up the pieces and, and carry, carry the Eastern conference torch forward into the finals, but we'll see. What are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a little bit of money on the nets from the preseason when they were, was there, when there was rumors about James Harden going there, I figured why not throw 10 bucks on him? So I'm kind of rooting for that to play out. Um, but the 76ers, you know, the, the story around them and Embiid and Simmons figuring it out and playing well together, seeing them top of the league and, it's it's nice to see the Doc Rivers come back moving from LA to Philly and that team performing well. I have to think that the Nets are the favorites coming out of the Eastern Conference, though, with the offensive efficiency, the three-point shooting from Joe Harris. I mean, this team is just so balanced across the board. They have decent bigs, they can rebound, they can stack up against any team. And Kevin Durant is just he's an MVP number two in the league type of player every single year to LeBron James personally, is my opinion. But he can he just can do everything. You know, seven foot shoot, he can defend. Yeah, I think the, that team is the way to go. The Bucks have been a team that's incredibly slept on for the Eastern Conference. I mean, really, did they are they any worse than they were the last couple seasons that they won the they had the one seed? And so I think people are just souring on them because of the fact that they've seen Giannis in the postseason. It's it's a and, fatigue. It's a Giannis fatigue for sure. He's back to back MVPs, and then right? they and haven't really done anything in the playoffs. Be, he should really be getting more consideration for MVP again this year. I mean, the guys have oh, an incredible yeah. season. Um, the Bucks are just one of those teams that people just don't believe that they can do it in the postseason anymore. So I think they, right. they're they're getting a little bit undervalued. And and similarly, I think the Clippers on the in the Western Conference are the same in the same boat. I think the Clippers in the Western Conference are a team that got the jersey on. They're yeah. I mean, look at I mean the Clippers are, have been slept on this whole season because the fact that people were so optimistic about their their talent and potential last year, and mm -hmm. they really the Clippers really just uh, choked for lack of a better word last year. They really just disappointed a lot of the expectations that a lot of people had placed on had placed on them and this year people don't want to get burned by the clippers they don't want to get burned by the bucks yet these two teams are both in the three seed right now in, in mm -hmm. a very comfortable spot to you know make a good postseason run and i i would be wary about both of them i think both of them could be very strong contenders for a, a finals appearance yeah, I mean, the Clippers are 9-1 and one in their last 10 games. They're absolutely making a move up the standings, and they could they, they could catch up to the Suns by the end of the year. The Suns have been the team that everybody is like, the dark horse Suns. You know, they got Chris Paul leading the way. Like, Chris Paul, all this renewed Chris Paul vigor with, you know, everybody wanted to throw him out the league when he was in Houston, leaving Houston, going to OKC. They thought, oh, right. you know, so, but, but Chris Paul was just going they to They had to attach picks. Yard. 
yeah for russell westbrook with chris paul like are you kidding me look at the way that trade turned out to be i'd much rather have paul for sure so uh, it's just a it's just a weird situation I, the suns are the team that people want to talk about but the clippers are the team that i think people should be talking about because the clippers have been the hottest team in the nba right now and with especially with jamal murray you know getting the acl injury he's going to be out for the season really devastating to see a lot, uh, a lot of question marks between Davis and LeBron and whether or not they're healthy and how effective they're going to be when they come back. Uh, there's just a lot of question marks. The Jazz had Donovan Mitchell go, da go down with the ankle sprain recently. This could be a year that, you know, the, the stars kind of align for the Los Angeles Clippers. And I, while I, I, I'm trying to also speak it into existence, I'm also trying to, you know, not, not – Jinx them. Because Jinx the, it too. The, the best thing about the Clippers is when they're slept on, when they're the underdogs, when people don't expect them to win, that's when they're at their best. When they have all these yeah. expectations, they get out to a 25-point lead. Like, that's when they're at their worst, go figure. Like, when they're expected to win, they mm -hmm. when they take the, the, gas, the foot off the gas – and they start to coast that's when they're really struggling and when they don't they don't know they don't have the autopilot they always have to be grinding always have to be fighting they don't have the autopilot that like lebron teams have when you know lebron goes down and they're still in the fifth seed and they're five and five or the last 10 like they're still a decent team because his mm -hmm. teams just go into autopilot and they they go they you know they collect wins they, they tread water that's not the clippers they're always up and down always riding the roller coaster of the highs and lows and so with the, as a Clippers fan over the years, there's been a lot of lows. Don't get me wrong. More lows than highs. But Is it a Paul George redemption season? You know, does, do I they mean, make he's a, been awesome. He's playing great this year, he's yeah. Playing, he looks back really to great. his OKC days when he him, was, like, close to the MVP. Him and Kawhi should finish in, like, the top five, top six, top seven MVP voting at least. Like they're, they're Kawhi really always great. slept on for the MVP voting, too. He just consistently puts up stats under the radar. Yeah. It'll be interesting. I, I, I'm optimistic. For like, if you, if I was a gambling man, I mean, obviously the the Nets and the Lakers are going to be favorites for uh, you know win the championship. But you know, there's a lot of value I think in the 76ers and the Bucks, as well as you know the Clippers. Um, maybe the, I'd consider the Suns as the dark horse. That's the that's the popular pick though. So usually when the public gets you know going on a team like that before the postseason even starts, you got to be wary of those types of things because especially in gambling circles, like the odds will be negatively affected by that type of stuff. So so what do you think, uh, if you had to pick right now a team to win the championship and a player to win the MVP this year, who are you, who are you going with? Jokic is my MVP, if, if the, especially if the Nuggets stay a top four seed where they are right now. They're, they're, uh, they have a, a three-game three lead over the Lakers from four to five. If the Nuggets could stay in that four seed, Jokic has to be the MVP for me. I mean, he's been incredible. Uh, I just Embiid's gonna play like fifty to fifty-two games. It's not enough mm -hmm. for me. I, I he's had a great season. He's just he, playing seventy-five percent of the game, playing seventy percent of the games just isn't enough for me. I, I he, and Harden's a cross off awesome. because of how, yeah. the way he left Houston. Don't, yeah, don't don't even give me two cents on Harden. Like you, you can't push yourself out of a team and then win the MVP. Yeah, yeah. he's he Fair is enough. disqualified for me. Really, it comes down to what. What would the stats have to look like? Over the last, you know, couple of weeks for, of the season, if he's averaging he over forty a game, and it, it would be just, impossible. Just impossible. You're talking about impossible stat lines for me to consider him as my MVP. Like mm -hmm. it would, it would be literally unprecedented stat lines, and that's not going to happen. So, the really the interesting storyline, the narrative coming about the last couple of days has been Steph Curry trying to advocate right. for his MVP candidacy. He's the Warriors are in the ninth seed right now. They're twenty nine and thirty, so one game under five hundred. They're going to be in the playing tournament in all likelihood. Like, can a team that's lower, they're going to be like, they're, if they stay in the ninth seed, I mean, maybe they could move up one spot to the eighth seed and beat the Grizzlies. But, like, it's – that would be you a crazy – You can't win the MVP award at 29 and 30. You can't be under 500 and win the MVP. But really, like, he, he has a legitimate candidacy for it because – Imagine how bad the Warriors – the Warriors would be the worst team in the NBA if they didn't have Curry. At this he's leading point. the league in scoring. I mean, the shots he's making he's over this last, like, 10-game stretch where he's averaging over 40, this he just the took the, you know, the leading – Curry. I mean, I yeah. know Curry had some incredible, incredible runs, like, in 20. It's also the most he's been needed, too, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, that's, he's never had this usage it. percentage. Uh, uh, you know, we, when he had Clay around him and KD, yeah. he never it's had really, to use it's his hard in, It's his Harden season. The, the yeah. fact that, I mean, Harden had to do all that bullshit in Houston, you know, could getting usage rates like near the 40%. Like, Curry has an opportunity now where he's needed to be used as in the increased fashion that he has been. And he has the ability and skill set to be better than Harden, I think, in this role. 
I mean, yeah. he's incredible. I still don't want to play the Warriors in the playoffs yeah. because Who Steph would put 50 Steph? on me. Oh, yeah, he could win two or three games on his own. On his own. Right. So they're a scary team if they make the postseason. I mean, they could really have some runs. So mm-hmm. what's what's interesting, too, with the NBA is this playing tournament. A lot of people don't really understand how this is going to shake out because the playing tournament, people think that oh, seven's going to play 10 and then eight's going to play nine. Like, that's not how it works. Okay, so seven's, seven's going to play eight. The winner of that game immediately wins the seven seed. They'll, they'll advance to the postseason seven and seven versus eight, and then nine's going to play ten. The loser of seven versus eight and the winner of nine versus ten then play each other for the eight seed. Eight seed, wow. So the loser of the nine versus ten game immediately gets eliminated. They play one postseason game. That's it. Um, right now, if you're the nine, you have to first. nine or ten. You'd have to win two in a row to make it. Exactly. And if you're the seven or eight going into you it, you have two shots. Win. Yeah. Got so it. that's how it's going to shake out. It's a little bit different than you expected. I think that's a probably a bit, the way they format it is actually a little bit better because yeah. you know, obviously you're giving a little bit of advantage to the seven and eight seeds. You don't want to just what you out. should, right? Yeah. If you finish four spots ahead, seven versus 10, then it's pretty strong. Totally. I'm looking forward to it. I mean, while, you know, it, it's obviously the playing tournament was a cash grab, the NBA trying to revitalize some of the revenue they lost during the pandemic. It's it's still playoff basketball. It's still pl- elimination games that we're going to be seeing. Like one game elimination games are those are always fun to watch. We're going to be possibly seeing Steph Curry play in these games. Possibly Zion. Fingers crossed. I mean, Zion's my number one player to watch in the NBA right now. He's incredible. Incredible. I haven't seen a guy like that since Shaq. Honestly, like he looks like he has his feet back under him a little bit. He's recovered from the injury. It seems like he's jumping he's higher amazing. again. Like back he's at amazing. Duke. It, what he what he has in his bag is unprecedented. I mean, really, it's a combination of like Shaq. Charles Barkley and like I don't mean LeBron James really like like the guy that the guy he's he's kind of a combination of these different guys that we've seen we because we've never seen a guy truly as unique as him he's he's a, he's an absolute hybrid for sure he's totally I mean he's he's undersized center really but really the next the next step that Zion is going to have to take to become the MVP is going to be the rebounding he's gonna he's mm-hmm. averaging I think like seven seven almost seven and a half rebounds a game he needs to get that over ten. And then yeah, he, Charles. He, something Charles Barkley loves to talk about. He's like, "Well, I average 13 rebounds a game. What is he doing? This look, yeah. look at his body, look at his athleticism. He should be easily double digits." When he makes that jump to double digit rebounds, is when he's going to be the MVP of the league, and he could go on a, a two to three to four year run of MVPs. I think he's he's that good. He's that special as long as he stays healthy. He's incredible. I, I don't know how he doesn't get every single missed shot. If if Zion's running to the rim on yeah. on after a shot, he should be slamming everything or jumping and grabbing every single ball. Like, I, if if I'm the coach, I'm setting him free. I'm saying, don't worry about getting back on defense. I want you crashing the hoop every single time. And the type of energy it brings when someone like a Zion Williamson gets a putback dunk or a LeBron James gets one off the backboard and slams it home is so invigorating for a team that like. I'd be like, you know, Zion, I don't even care if you play defense. I just want you releasing and taking off. I mean, it's just he's just incredible. So for sure it should be in double digits. Totally. All right, let's talk a little bit MLB baseball. We got some we got early season baseball going on right now, and it's been an exciting start to the season. Really, the st- the storyline that everybody's got to be monitoring is the Dodgers Padres rivalry. It's it's back. And I mean, it, well, it's not it's never really been back because the Padres have always been the little brother to the Dodgers. They basically been they've been called Los Angeles South, essentially, Petco Park with, you know, the games in Petco being predominantly Dodger fans traveling down from Los Angeles. And, and now with the Padres being an elite team, I, I think, honestly, I think that the two best teams in Major League Baseball are the Dodgers and Padres. And then go figure, I think the two worst teams are the Diamondbacks and Rockies. So you got the two best teams and the two worst teams, I think, potentially in the same division. You got four teams in that extreme of difference in, in talent level and skill level. Um, all in the NOS. It's crazy. Uh, but it's it's good for baseball that we're seeing these two teams that are playing this well, are this talented, are this elite, filled with so many faces of, of stardom and, and baseball and going to be t- the Tatises and the Mookie Betts and the Bellingers and the Machados and the Darvishes and the Snells and Kershaws and, and Trevor Tatis. Bowers. Like, there are so many personalities in this matchup between the Dodgers and the, and the Padres that these teams are going to be, you know, mad at each other and competing against each other at a very high level for multiple years now and i i think that it, this is what baseball has been craving craving for years now and it's good to see this is another mm-hmm. red sox yankees type of rivalry yeah battle of uh southern cal i love it it's been fun i mean really i i 
I, I, I was a Padres optimist coming to the season. I, I thought that they, you know, had a chance to be more hungry and, and, you know, maybe push the Dodgers at a second place berth. But look, the Dodgers are proving that, you know, they are the best team. And, and I thought they were the best team coming into the year. I just thought, you know, there was going to be a little bit of yeah. regular season pacing, some world series hangover, some contentness to, you know, take some off the gas and coast through the, the regular season and just, you know, obviously make another big postseason push. Uh, but look, the Dodgers are proving that last year was possibly the, they're now in possibly the easiest title defense run that you've ever seen because last year they only played 60 regular season games. We forget like the, the season was much shorter. They had a lot more downtime time to recover. Like this is, this is going to be the year that I think if, if any might be the easiest season to repeat as champions for the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. Um, just because you know they're they're physically not as overwhelmed, they resign they uh, they signed Bauer. They brought in the best pitcher in the free yep. agent market during the off season. Like this team is elite, 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 and they're the kind of team that could multi- could win multiple World Series titles over the course of three to four years. I think. Yeah. So going back to the article you wrote on AllThingsAnalysis.com, you did an MLB preview. And I think you picked the Padres I did. Uh, to I finish above the Dodgers. Yeah. Do you think that that still holds or would you switch your choice now after no. seeing the first 15 or so games? No, I would probably, I would, I would definitely switch to, I think the Dodgers are going to be the, the winners of that division. I was optimistic for the Padres, but you really, the Tatis injury has me worried. He does not look hundred percent healthy while he hit the home run on his first game back. It was really neat to see him, you know, want to play in that Dodgers series. That was his focus all along when he was on the IL. He was trying to make the comeback to be in this Dodgers series. Um, he he, a shoulder injury can be something that nags you for a long time. Especially, he's a right-handed hitter. It's his leading shoulder, his left shoulder that affects your power. That could sap some of your power. It's just, it just has me very worried. They uh, they pitched J- Denelson Lamette for his season debut last year. He was only able to go two innings. He has uh, another forearm strain. He looks like he might be headed towards an, an inevitable Tommy John surgery, which is just heartbreaking. I mean, now they have Lamette and Clevenger out on Tommy John surgeries, which is just, you never, it's just so brutal when you see such an elite pitcher go down with that. It's like, you just want to see yeah. the guy pitch. You just want to see him healthy. And it right. sucks when that happens. And that's a major, major, you know, blow for the, for the Padres. It, the health, it, the, the Padres don't have, well, they try, they're trying to mimic the type of depth that the Dodgers have created in Los Angeles. They don't quite have it yet. They can't suffer yep. the types of injuries that the Dodgers can. Like Bell- Bellinger has been injured for the Dodgers for essentially the full year. He he had a, a slow couple of games to start, and then now he's on the IL. And you haven't even noticed it. The, God, the Dodgers, you know, play bets in center, and they put Muncie at first base, and they're completely fine. They have mm-hmm. they have replacement players that are above league average, and they they you know one guy goes down, the next one picks up the pace, and they don't lose anything, and that's not something that the Padres have quite yet been able to replicate, and I just think it, the Padres are just too poised, too ready for you know a, a, a title defense. I think is in their future, and they're they're going to make the postseason a hundred percent, and whether or not they make a, a postseason run, I think is going to come down to health, and whether or not other teams are healthy, whether or not the Dodgers are healthy. It's it's the, there's no team that is better built for the regular season than the Dodgers this year. Yeah, I mean, when you have the amount of depth they do, where you can rotate in and and replace amazing players with still above average players, you're in a really good position to make. Yeah, a I mean, long they got run. guys like freaking Zach McKinstry. You, you, I'm sure you'd never heard of this guy, Zach McKinstry. And he he's he's been their best hitter basically this this regular season so far. I mean, he's in. I, I think he's still hitting over 300 with, he was leading that he had like two or three home runs early in the year. Like he, he's a, he's essentially replacing Kike Hernandez as their super utility guy. Cause Kike got, went and signed with the Red Sox during the off season. But the guy was not even expected to possibly, he was possibly expected to start in the minor leagues this year. And he's been one of their best hitters and playing all over the, all over the diamond, playing infield, outfield, wherever you, wherever the Dodgers need him. Just guys like this depict what the Dodgers do all the time. They develop talent. They get the most out of players' abilities. They know how to take pitches. They know how to work counts. Like Mac Mun- Max Muncy is one of my least favorite players to watch because he's so boring. But he's also one of the best players in baseball because he sees the most pitches. He works counts. He gets he gets tons of walks. I think he's still got over a 400 OBP right now. 
I mean, he's so boring, but he's so good at the same time. And the Dodgers are riddled with this type of these types of players. Mm -hmm. The really, the Dodgers and the Padres are the are the headline for the MLB season so far. But what do you the, think about the Athletics on their eleven game win streak currently? Yeah, I was going to mention a bit of money ball. Yeah, the the A's are on a hot streak. I really. Look, I think the A's are always a team that overachieves with their, their talent. I, I just don't think that they have the lineup that is going to be able to be consistent throughout the year. Like, they really lost some key players uh, during the offseason. They, they they let, like, Marcus Simeon go. They lost one of their best relievers, Pet Petit. Um, they lost Hendricks, one of the best. There, He was a closer. He was the best closer in, in baseball last year. And so I think there are some shortcomings that will be exposed throughout the course of a season when the depth gets tested for Oakland. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really don't like Elvis Andrews coming from Texas. I think he's damaged goods. He's been per terrible uh, to start the season for Oakland. He's been really bad. Uh, but really, they do have some young talent that you can't ignore, like Matt Chapman, Matt Olson. They have some really good players. I mean, Loriano in center field, who's someone who I really, really love to watch play. Um, he, he, the talent with him is like the power and, and speed is in on an elite level with that center field of Loriano. And then he also has mm. a cannon of an arm that he could just unleash at any time with that incredible right. throw. So it, the, uh, the A's are a fun team, but I just don't think they have the depth to withstand the what what's inevitably coming from the Angels and the, the Astros. I think that the Astros had the COVID, you know, they had the COVID outbreak the last week, and uh, they really are trying to just tread water until their guys get back. And the, the Astros are a very talented team that I still think should be the favorites to win the NL West. But the A's are always going to be a team that overachieves and is always going to be there. And I think that it's going to be a fun division. The NL West is wide open for me. I mean, really, the Angels are my, – my team, obviously, I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm, I can't be unbiased about it, but they're, they're so fun to watch this year and so good oh, they're, they're very good they're a very good team the pitching is going to be what's going to be their backbone whether or not you know they're able to make the postseason and, and eventually make a postseason run if possible but the otani and trout and eventually rendon and jared walsh like their lineup is elite very very good like otani is one of, is one of the best hitters in baseball at this point he's he's hitting very very well and then when he pitches he i know he's only he was only been able to go four innings in each of his two outings but I mean, the guy had six uh, six strikeouts, seven walks, and zero earned runs. The first time anybody has ever done that, thrown four innings, uh, given up seven walks, six strikeouts, and given up zero runs. Like that's never happened in baseball history. Not easy talk, to do. Talk about effective effective wildness. Like the guy is you. He's very difficult to hit, and so when as he cleans up his delivery, as he becomes a little bit more consistent, a little bit more economical with his pitches, he'll learn. Hopefully, you, as an Angels fan, you're optimistic for those you know trends that start developing. But the talent level with a guy like Otani is something none of us have ever seen, ever. And it's so fun to watch. It's been so fun to watch. And then this is, I mean, I've gone this far talking about the Angels and I only, I only mentioned Mike Trout once. But the guy still, let, just check, check. Like, it's, it's, it's April 22nd. It's almost 11 a.m. on April 22nd. And Mike Trout's still the best player in baseball. So... That's that's always going to be. You know, do you know his batting average on hand, Ben? It's it's high three hundreds. It's like what three ninety three, yeah. just a touch under four hundred. The only guy over four hundred, Ronald Acuna Jr. right now, who's also just hitting the hitting the leather off the baseball. Yeah, Acuna's, so. Acuna's awesome too. I mean, Acuna and Incredible. Soto, Acuna and Soto have that National League in good hands. I mean, Acuna and Juan Soto are two of the best players I've ever seen come out of you know young prospects to come into the big leagues with, since Trout really. For me, it's been since Trout that a young player has come and immediately been this excellent, this great. Um, I, I love watching those two plays. Acuna is an awe-inspiring display of athleticism. He, he, hit a, he hit a routine ground ball to D.D. Gregorius against the Phillies a few days ago. I think it was last week. A routine, literally routine ground ball. Hit it hard, right to, right to the shortstop. Beat it out. Beat it out to first base. He ran like th over 30, uh, 30 feet per second. Uh, That's insane. Elite, like, like he, he, I think he, he topped the fastest speed that anybody had been tracked yet this season, um, and it's just incredible to see the, what these guys do. I mean, Soto is possibly the most professional hitter I've ever seen since Barry Bonds. Uh, the guy has a savant level of hitting intelligence. The guy sees things that pitchers. And hitter, hitters can only dream of interpreting the way pitchers attack them. 
the way Soto does. He is incredible the way he makes adjustments in mid at bat. He makes adjustments in the middle of his at bats to he he he'll be you know oh I'm, I'm pulling off this pitch. Let me go to left field with it, and he drives the ball the opposite way like. Uh, it's incredible to watch that guy play. I love watching him hit. He's my favorite hitter in the sport. I think pure hitter. I I take Soto as the number one pure hitter in the sport wow. right now. I think the best all around player, um, all, best all around player is Otani, really most talented player. But I mean, you look at Trout and what he does year in and year out. So he's the most consistent, one of the best hitters I've ever seen. Um, but his 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 level of athleticism is right there with Acuna too. So. It's just the, yeah. the the game is in great hands. There's just so many great players, um, and it's it's really interesting when we look at people trying to say baseball is in a bad shape right now. And we're honestly looking at a potential labor strike after this season. I the CBA expires, the collective bargaining agreement expires after this season. We're possibly looking at a work stoppage after this year. It's the game. It should be in a much better state than we're looking at it right now. I mean, we got so many excellent players. So many, the game's so much never fun been younger. players, exciting the bat younger. flips. Yeah. yeah. See, teams are younger than ever. Like that should be something that invigorates new fans, but we're seeing a lot of struggles. And it, honestly, it's, it's shameful the way that the league office has handled some of the stuff that's been going on. Um, it's really, funny though. We're talking about the league getting younger and yet we have a guy like Nelson Cruz, who's only one 40, home, rag, like home run back old, from, he's 40 years old and he's, he's one home run back from the league league. Like what's going on there that he's just been doing it forever. Incredible. Yeah. He's a guy that he's never going to stop hitting. He's, he's the Julio Franco of our generation. That guy's incredible. Yeah, he's just a born hitter. Yeah. The Red Sox too have been in an incredible tear. They lost their first three games and then they went, they went on to win nine in a row, I think. And then mm -hmm. they, they're, they're leading the NL, uh, AL East right now. And the team that people thought was going to be the presumptive AL East winners the New York Yankees have been co completely collapsing and it's only mid April. Like the Yankees have yeah. no pitching and the Red Sox are the hottest team in baseball or one of the hottest teams in baseball. Yeah. JD Martinez has been on an absolute tear. If he had three home runs the last week in one game, um, yep. it's he's leading the league in the RBIs right now with 20. Yeah. The Red Sox are a very fun team. And while I question whether or not the pitching is going to be able to keep them afloat throughout the season, uh, I'm not optimistic about their pitching, their pitching talent. Uh, but they do have a very young competitive lineup. I mean, a lot of I the, mean, Bo Bogarts is hitting awesome, he's awesome too. He's awesome. I love he's Devers three too. And hits in the league. Devers is awesome too. Um, there's just really a lot of young, great players on the Red Sox, and there's uh, going to be some young players for the Sox that uh, I'm I'm going to be on the lookout for potentially collecting their cards, their rookie cards for it. I mean, guys mm -hmm. like Bobby Dalbeck. There's there's some good players uh, for the Red Sox this year, and I think that. Um, in the collectibles market, I think they could be capitalized because the Red Sox are a team that is a popular public perception team. Where the lot mm. in, in the hobby market, like they're a team that their cards are going to be more desirable just because of the Red Sox and they're out of Boston. They're a big, a big market team, so something to keep an eye on there too. Oh, one guy. So before we wrap up the MLB too, I can't I can't wrap it up without mentioning what your mean Mar Mercedes Mercedes has been able to do for the Chicago White Sox. He went. He, did you see? He started his season eight for eight. He started his career and his season for the first time ever, going eight for eight. Nobody had ever started a season, let alone a career that way. So incredible what that guy was able to do. And he even pitched the other night. He pitched for the Chicago White Sox as a position Holy player. Bro. See, he 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 didn't pitch that well, but I mean, he was a position player, position pitching. But the guy is yeah, incredible. He's, he's just below Mike Trout in terms of batting average. He's going three ninety right now. Yeah. He killed the Angels in their opening series. He 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 was unbelievable. He, the Angels couldn't stop him, and uh, he's really helping the White Sox get over the loss of the early season loss of Eloy Jimenez. He tore his pectoral muscle in spring training at the end of it, and they had the Yermin Mercedes was kind of thrust into an everyday role as the as the DH for the White Sox, really taking up the mantle for that position really well. Okay, one topic that has been really grinding my gears for baseball though this year it's just it drives me crazy and really it's it's an overall sports issue at this point we're seeing a lot of it in the nba too is that just I, I i hate to sound like an old an old grandpa here complaining about you know the state of things but sports officiating is it seems like hitting an all-time low across sports in general like it's it's been horrendous what we've been seeing out of some of these sufficient umpires and nba referees like it's just it's disgraceful the way that 
uh, umpires and referees are ejecting players and coaches just like at the drop of a hat with the rabbit ears and and just being super sensitive about what's been going on like the nba ca calling technical fouls for a player pumping his chest and pounding it like you can't show any emotion the mlb um the league office suspending nick castellanos for two games after he pumped his chest sliding into home when the pitcher drilled him earlier in the inning and then meet him in the back on the on the slide at home like that was a terrible terrible way to officiate that and i know that's kind of coming from coming down from the league office but really it's all one piece of the puzzle where these the officiating of sports sporting contents sporting contests is just getting really really poor and i think we saw it in the women's national basketball tournament too multiple times you yeah. know where there were just plays at, at the end of the game where the i, I forget what team was the baylor the, the girl drove to the hoop on a last second shot was hammered by two uconn players and then the next game, there was a, a UConn foul call that they actually reviewed, showed that the, uh, the lady, the woman only touched the ball with her hand and they still called the foul on her and ejected her from the game. And it's just like, how, how is this being allowed? How is this not being monitored, being reviewed? And how are refs not being more accurate, especially with all the tools that they have nowadays? I, yeah. it, it, there's something weird going on. I don't well, know, Ben. Really, ultimately, I think that the reason why we have to talk about it on the podcast and why it's it's starting to get more talked about in the public opinion and, and public forums um, is because fans of uh, and spectators of the sport sports we watch are getting frustrated with the lack of transparency of, of reasoning why calls are made the way they're made. Like we mm -hmm. spend in a baseball game they'll spend sometimes upwards of like 10 minutes on a, on a call it's supposed to take reminds you only two minutes they're supposed to call it after two minutes but that doesn't stop them from you know delaying the game for up to 10 minutes at times like these reviews are taking forever and then they just get the call and they get no explanation for what happened and what they saw like what all there needs to do is be more transparency in the way that these calls are reviewed the way they're seen by the officiants and and why they make the calls they do like we need to understand this because it's it's creating some frustration in sports fans i think because the fact that a call is made and, and replay isn't helping some of this like in baseball we've seen some replays we saw the play where um at the end of the game the the mets were facing the Mar the marlins and the marlins closer had the bases loaded michael conforto was up in, in a regular season game conforto oh yeah the elbow leaned his, oh. leaned his elbow over the strike zone gets nicked, over the plate gets nicked on a strike a high end strike gets nicked in the elbow and the mets won the game and they can't review it but it's all over it's re, it's all over the news it's all over the, the even the mets announcers like were like just they were discounting the win in disbelief, right yeah, away just... they were they couldn't believe that they 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 the umpires didn't call this and this there's just so much lack of transparency in the Angels game. There was a slide against the Blue Jays where the guy uh, clearly went out of the baseline to slide and try to take out the second base guy, uh, Fletcher, to try to uh, disrupt, disrupt his throw. And play. he did. And he did. And it cost the Angels really so much momentum. They ended up giving up like seven runs in the inning. And it was a big play. And the, the, they reviewed it. They actually went to review and they could not get it right. And there's just we need some transparency as to why even replays are failing us why aren't replays being as spectators we're able to see is there are there angles that we're not seeing are there you know cameras that were that we're not exposed to like what's going on why are these calls being made the, the way they are because there are so many examples of just the 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 actual in-person umpires and referees and officiants failing to do their jobs correctly and then the replay officials also failing to do their jobs correctly there's just too much of this going on and in a modern era of sports like this is a potential you know threat to sports success like if baseball wants to be a t uh, a young a young man sport if they want more fans if they want newer fans like maybe being the lead in uh umpire what do you call it umpire o overhaul or new new processes or or uh, uh renewing like just the uh, process for umpiring and making it better like they, they could be one of the first sports to make it better make it more transparent or make more plays reviewable or make it a quicker replay or right. maybe even a little shameless plug of my old my former article 
few months ago, maybe even some robot umpires or uh, an aspect of a, a hybrid officiant, or maybe like some of it's robots, some of it's a real umpire. There are different ways that these things can be integrated into the modern era of sports. And right. it would just be nice that to improve this because really sports officiating has just been really grinding my gears over the last few months. It's just been really, really bad. As long as there's a human element, there are going to be human mistakes in the game, despite having all these tools at our disposal, because people have preferences. I, I yeah. don't hate the human element, quote unquote. Like, ideally, the human element makes the game a little bit better. But we just need to figure out a better way to integrate the human element with the technology we have, because there's definitely a lag when we do these reviews that people don't like. I think we need to automate some of it. When we think about tennis and they automate the review and they show the exact shot of the ball, whether it hits the line or not, we can do this in baseball because the baseball field can be completely mapped out and the rules are set in such a way that everything is very well defined. It'd yeah. be much harder to do in something like football where, I mean, holy crap, I don't even know the rules of football because they're so hard to interpret sometimes, but yeah. In baseball, it's something that we can define and we can automate for sure. And I think we should at least some parts of it. Yeah, for me, I have a hard time imagining how the uh, the strike zone should be automated in baseball because I think that a lot of pitchers, you know, make their living by painting the corners and kind of expanding the strike zone um, you, by being able to just um, – being Same thing with to, catchers too. Yeah, like a pitcher is able to ex expand the zone by working the corners and making an umpire, you know, call pitches, you know, an inch or two off the plate. Like that's an aspect of the sport. And if you work hard as a pitcher and a catcher to frame it, like that, that I the my opinion, the talent for sure. That 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 is a skill differ differentiator for baseball. And so there are I I would not I would discourage taking that away from the game. But I would also figure that there's a better way to do this. There needs to be more transparency. There needs to be more willingness to you know support these types of efforts to improve umpiring and officiating i think that in general like police you know how people are trying to reform the police reforming efficiency is a similar you know effort retrain so right maybe maybe less significant to our society's benefit but you know For similar 100 sure. 100 percent. i would never by no means try to compare <laughs> the two you know apples to apples but it is it is a, a similar you know pandemic or epidemic where umpires are just really struggling to get these calls right and i think that in general, we could do better. Mm -hmm. All right, Connor, any last thoughts? Um, just to make sure that you subscribe to our platforms and the website if you want to be entered to win some awesome free stuff. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in to everything that All Things Analysis has to offer. And thank you for having me on the show, Ben. Of course, buddy. All right, everybody. Remember, Connor, I'll, I'll reiterate, subscribe, rate, review, Vicious Talk with Benny P on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, wherever you're getting your listening, for, your listening done. Uh, please support the podcast. We really appreciate it. Also, Connor was mentioning, subscribe, uh, follow All Things Analysis on Instagram and subscribe to our website to enter our free, our free giveaway, the NBA Don Russ Box Break on May 8th. We'll be announcing the, uh, the winners for that and doing our box break then. Uh, also, be on the lookout for our Fantasy Rap Draft Podcast article update follow-up coming up soon. We're working on, uh, you know, getting a, a follow for anybody to listen to that Rap Fantasy Draft Podcast. That was a lot of fun. I would definitely recommend it. But we also have an article coming out soon to kind of, you know, flesh out some of the details we weren't able to, you know, get get onto yeah. the podcast. That was a lot of fun, though. Point out some of the, the music that we really like from these artists. We're going to have some YouTube videos embedded in the article, and we're going to go over some of the snubs from the different categories, too. Very cool. All right, Connor, thanks so much again for joining me on the Vicious Talk with Benny P. Remember to ask yourself at the end of the day, are you vicious? Good night! <laughs>